That Natural Pathic Podcast. TNP. Hello there. Hi, and thanks for joining us. I'm Dr. Michelle Pobega, naturopathic doctor. And I'm Dr. David Miller, ND, and we hear your frustrations. This show is for you. This show is for you if you're feeling like your current healthcare strategy is not getting to the root cause or the underlying reasons for your health. This show is for you if you've been told that you're fine, but you definitely don't feel very well. This show is for you if you're walking out of your doctor's office with one, two, three, four, or even five medications without any mention of diet, lifestyle, or a long-term game plan. This show is for you if you've got several specialists taking care of you, but no one is really putting all the pieces together. This show is for you if you believe that health should be part of healthcare. These problems have solutions. We know it. Our patients know it. And we want you to know it. Naturopathic medicine is the solution that you should know about. Okay, welcome to another episode of That Naturopathic Podcast. Dr. David Miller, ND here. Dr. Michelle Bobega, ND, what's up? Hi, everyone. Uh, Today, we're just going to have a short and sweet little recording about some really interesting clinical moments we've had in the last couple of weeks, right? Yeah, real life implementation. uh, It's That's where it's all about. I think, isn't that where we learn the most, I feel? That's just it. And, 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 And the interesting thing is, is, um, my, my particular experience with this client didn't require an elaborate protocol. It actually just required some really just foundational, simple things. Um, and that was really that great. That could be it, though. That's uh, it. And I'll, you know what? I'll tie it in with um, another great clinician uh, that <clears throat> we both know is Tanya Lee. Right? Tanya, Tanya Lee. Lee. Tanya Lee is an amazing clinician. Rock star. Yeah, she's great. She's just like a, a badass clinician. And, yeah. and the, when I say the word clinician, I mean like someone who just gets, she's efficiently getting clinical results with patients. It's, she, you know, she's not an Instagram hero or, or whatever. She's just like, if you need someone good in Toronto, uh, I highly recommend uh, Tanya Lee. So mm-hmm. to tie it in, uh, what you're saying is simple, fundamental stuff. And then we'll tie that with our previous episode on SIBO. SIBO. She had a, she had a patient with, um, I think she had a patient with SIBO, SIBO who'd gone to this. SIBO. 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 <laughs> anyway, she, she, <laughs> she went to multiple, uh, doctors and, and naturopaths, I think. And then Tanya was like, you're stressed. And I think Tanya ended up giving her um, like a Nervine. Yeah, I remember <laughs> and, you telling me that before. And I was like, ta-da. Yeah, cool. Like very simple, mm-hmm. different sort of um, perspective on the problem, which is sometimes what you need. Uh, but very simple, you know, mm-hmm. in, in the end. And then uh, bye-bye SIBO because uh, she treated the patient. Um, so that's mm-hmm. so that's so cool. And that ties in with what you're saying. You know, sometimes you just need some fundamental stuff. So do you want to maybe do you want to? Well, I'll, I'll say mine was about a, a very specific condition called uh, pancreatic pseudocyst. And so it's a little it's a little different nerdier than um, what, what you're going to start us off with. But talk to us a little bit about some of the fundamental stuff you did for an immune. It was immune. It was an immune, um, uh, yeah, an immune supportive. Uh, Got to be careful with my wording around immune system these days. Yeah, um, it is a female child, four years, seven months old. Um, I've already been working with their parents for her, their parents' particular issues. And then mm-hmm. their mom brought her to me uh, maybe like three, four weeks ago um, with the main complaint about how Uh, She just chronically gets sick. So this is a family who doesn't use an excess, doesn't use like chemically charged, you know, detergents and antiseptics and antimicrobial this and like they're not the hyper sanitary, like they they live in harmony with this environment and like their kids go outside and play all the time and always have connection to nature and probably eat dirt from once in a while. And, you know, a little ne- dirt never hurt. And, um, and they eat really well. Right. And uh, the child has no, like no issues with integrating foods, but it was interesting for the first year in a bit of her life, this child never got sick. And then after COVID with like the 10 or 12 months where things, everything was really locked up. Um, it's almost as if by age three, She's just kind of getting sicker than anybody else in the household, like consistently, always a runny nose. And it would cause scabbing under the nose and a burning feeling. And she'd be very mucousy, which would sometimes trigger gagging and then throwing up. Um, but there was no change in her personality or her, or 
for her energy, which was interesting, never had a fever, but it was like at least once a month, if not more frequently that she would get sick. And there was even some interesting things like if she catches a cold wind or something like that, or she gets physically cold, she might get sick the next day. Um, so I was going to look for a homeopathic for this, but I thought, you know, in the interim, let's start them with some basics. And I was like, I'll, I'll look into something because there was some really good keynote, you know, uh, responses there but then also sometimes she gets those little bumps on the backs of red arms and then the mom also commented that she noticed that if she has any sugar she's far more susceptible to getting cold so uh no digestive issues um and 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 everything else is pretty much unremarkable like she's a great sleeper she eats well she drinks good water good energy like so there there wasn't a lot to go by except for just these really interesting symptom picture and honestly her mom was already giving her vitamin c and her mom was already giving her elderberry syrup and sometimes she would have the occasional oregano oil and i was like i don't my intuition is just saying we start simple i gave her zinc gummies the chewable gummies for kids i gave her cod liver oil because of the red bumps in the back of the arm i was like hey that'll that'll hit the skin and she does have Chicken a bit skin. of eczema yeah so i was like essential fatty acids, natural source of vitamin D, natural source of vitamin A without ever having to buy three different products. Yeah, old gave, school immune tonic. Right. And then yeah. I gave her uh, neuro, HMF Neurogen powder, which is a probiotic that has like glutamine in it in case there was a leaky gut, especially with the response to the sugars. I thought maybe her microbiome needs a little bit of a boost. And I had a follow up with her this week and she was like, she hasn't been sick since we've talked to you. The scabbing healed under her nose. She was like, can I just give this formula to all of my kids now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, you know, I'm glad we're out of the woods, but, you know, it's still too soon to tell. So keep up this protocol maybe until the end of the winter season. So like maybe early March, mid-March to ensure that her immune system stays robust. And then I said, and then we can reconvene then unless anything remarkable happens in the interim but the mom was super happy she's like i feel like i'm not having to like keep putting out fires with like this child mm -hmm. having constant colds and she was like and i have she has like she has a pretty large family so she's like i have a lot of kids and this one needed my undivided attention constantly for just constant runny nose constantly mm -hmm. throwing up from gagging on mucus or something she's like it was getting it was getting um really really Baby Munchausen. cumbersome cumbersome yeah yeah so uh so i was like yeah i feel for you and the mom was like super stoked that her child is looking a little bit more vital and resilient which is kind of a big deal yeah that's awesome uh yeah. number one i'll step in and say that little keynote the get every time there's like a, a cold wind mm -hmm. you get a cold uh, think about aconite i was um, looking at that one too i was looking yeah. at a few and uh, a little like a little tip on aconite i i know a bit about aconite um because it's in that uh sorlax that i made mm. old source top sorlax and it's probably the main player and so aconite um i hope someone figures this out someday but aconite has like some immune tonifying something that it does it's it's fairly um fairly good at nipping some colds like if you get if you like feel like a cold's coming on, you can sometimes nip it just like it nips cold sores. Like it, it does that probably I'd say yeah. in 80% of people. So aconite is something. Um, I'll have to that keep that maybe, in mind. Yeah. And it's it a good one just up, to have in your, yeah. like, in your rep in your sort of repertoire. Yeah, it did. It did come up when I was doing a bit of a search. There was like two or three that I was weighing out and aconite was one of them because it did have that cold, catching a cold or a cold wind picture, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. Um, it's an interesting thing that they noticed. Yeah. That, you know, that's that's yeah. kind of cool. Yeah, the yeah. mom was really the mom was really uh, he's on to it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I was I was appreciative of those very specific types mm -hmm. of details she gave me because I was like, ooh, maybe I can find a homeopathic. Yeah. Um, and I was prepared to give her some options and kind of go through it and be like, are there any more symptoms within this profile that fit your child's picture? But things were moving already in the right trajectory. So I didn't have to take that next step, which was that's nice. cool. Yeah. Remember, you know, homeopathy is quite yang in its nature. It's not a substance, so it has no yin in a sense. And so if I, I like what, you know, if you did what you did and then you have, you know, aconite on hand to sort of direct, remember mm -hmm. that's, you know, to direct the, um, the yin supportive stuff you did, because that's the other stuff you did is more like it supports the, you know, physical corporeal structure. Grr. Yeah. Yeah. So that would cool. be a good one. I'm going to have to keep up. that aconite in mind. That's the thing where I'm not good at like 
you have good uh, in your in your memory bank, you have just good snapshots of acute homeopathics, just like Sarah Hawthorne does and people who work with a lot of kids because you can use homeopathics really well with kids and it's just not my strength. So I feel like it's something that I do want to hone in on with like as, as a skill. Bring it um Bring it back to another thing you said uh, we mm-hmm. talked about before is that kids have great vitality. You just brought up yeah. with the homeopathic side of things. And I think that's important to, uh, it's important to accept too. Like that's why I think kids do quite well with homeopathics and very oftentimes simple interventions like what you did. Yeah. And they have less garbage interfering with the healing yeah. process because they haven't, yeah. they just haven't accumulated so much shit by living life like adults do. So it's just a lot easier to redirect <laughs> things in a child Uh, yeah yeah. kids are so i I mean i just watched i when i had um i was looking after my boy uh playing with my boy yesterday he wasn't keen on eating and we were just playing like we love to play Mm -hmm. and and uh he didn't want to eat i'm like chum chum like we gotta eat buddy come on like we gotta you gotta eat something here pal and he's so excited we're having fun 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 and then uh i watched him he's like i go poo now and he went he went off and pooed in the corner and i was like that's why he didn't so he he's little chum chum has helped me understand that there's this link between like when you're kind of backed up you get less hungry for him for that period of time because then he was after he pooed he was hungry so kids are really cool for get, like making things a little simpler and clearer because like you said they have less uh going on in a way to yeah. cloud their little insights yeah. Yeah, I'm thanks, super, Chum Chum. I'm super, uh, yeah, thanks, Chum Chum. Uh, I'm super uh, interested in understanding a little bit more about this. What was it called? Pancreatic duct cystitis? Oh, so yeah, pancreatic pseudocyst. Pseudocyst. Uh, so we, yeah, so we'll move on. I guess we'll move on to pancreatic uh, pseudocyst. Um, so pseudocysts are formed when there's like a, a, a disruption of the pancreatic duct or, or its branches and there's anatomical deviance. Is that bad to say? Variants, 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 deviance. 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 Yeah, devi- deviance. Well, we say see deviated septum, so maybe that's okay. But anyways, there's like little bit, little bit different anatomy that can, uh, can sort of lead from the uh, the ducts of the pancreas into the um, small intestine, um, and uh, the sphincter under uh, that's controlling that is the sphincter of Odi, hmm. and so. What's happening when you get this uh, pancreatic pseudocyst is is when uh, one of those branches or however the, you know, the structural conductor of the uh, pancreatic duct um, gets injured or perhaps I think sometimes there's just a net increase in resistance to flow because you got a dysfunctional sphincter vodi or the ampulla evader or whatever you want to, however you want to look at the anatomy there. Um, they say it says I'm looking at PubMed here, just like PubMed books, and it says uh, there are complication of pancreatitis. And I just wanted to say this: this uh, guy who has who had uh, pancreatitis uh, and pseudocyst formation, he didn't drink like to any kind of excess. So and, he had pancreatitis as well. Yeah, that's what he went. In. He had like I think he had lipase. Uh, you know, he had you know all the all the markers of of yeah. pancreatitis. But you know, the problem is sometimes we we sort of label people with, you know, oh, he must have been a smoker because you, you read your textbook on pancreatitis, but he must have been a drinker and a smoker. Yeah, yeah. You know, and he, he's, he's not. Like, he had, he had a few drinks, but he's not, like, he's not a, he's not an alcoholic, you know, and I think right. we have to be careful too, like, when, when, um, when we're labeling people like that. So he, um, anyway, the, he's lost, like, I don't know, this, I think it's like 60 pounds. If I pull up his chart, I think it would show something like he's lost 60 wow. pounds. Good for him. Yeah. Well, no, it was because I mean that was the he's he he was probably a little overweight, but because of the pancreatic problems, he's just had like digestive. Oh, disorder, it wasn't like intentional. Crazy. It wasn't intentional no. weight loss to help remedy the situation. I thought it was exactly. an intentional weight loss. Okay, got no, it. No, exactly. So so that gets marked under unintentional weight loss, which is a red flag, right? You, right. You okay. Don't want unintentional uh, weight loss. Sorry, I just wasn't clear about the whole story. So um, we got to get his weight up now. Um, cause okay. you know, cause the pancreas is a huge player in, in absorption. Um, anyway, so, uh, this is, this is a, this is like a, a condition where I was like, thank God I have this understanding of anatomy from visceral manipulation training. Cause it's like, well, wait, like if you have a net increase in resistance to flow of a one way 
you know, track of enzymes that break shit down and all that. I mean, that's that's going to contribute to some risk to the to the wimpy pancreas. And and it looks like that's what happens. What's that? Yeah, you think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I do like, think. <laughs> well, it's like your goal, you know, you get a, a blocked, uh, you know, bile duct. It, and, and these, by the way, those these two can combine too. So you can have a gallbladder stone uh, that then is blocking the now that's blocking the entrance of the the pancreatic uh, enzymes. So then you can get a pancreatitis, uh, then pseudocyst, pancre- uh, pancreatic pseudocyst downstream from a liver gallbladder issue, which is which yep. is like really kind of tying tying together your your expertise a little bit there too. But um, what what we're doing is we're we're going in with a very structurally uh, anatomically uh, informed approach mm-hmm. because we that's something that we just don't do very much of in um, in medicine whether it's um, whether it's conventional or naturopathic I, I mean I think if I didn't know this visceral uh, manipulation perspective I don't know what I would do oh well, take some anti-inflammatory well, he's not systemically inflamed like it's very CRP localized. Was fine. Yeah, it's very localized. And it's very localized to a wimpy little organ called the pancreas, which is a very important organ, but it's wimpy. You know, mm-hmm. the pancreas, if you look at it as a organ, it's like a it's like you took a bunch of cooked oatmeal and wrapped it in saran wrap. That's kind of what it's, it's it doesn't really have like a hard uh capsule to protect it. It's a kind of it's a wimpy organ. It's an interesting so analogy. It, That's so interesting. <laughs> so it, it it it's his pancreas is just getting sort of eaten, and I think it. And, and I don't have a follow up yet, so you know I'll I'll keep you posted. But I'm just so happy, and I and I wanted. And I know it's not a super common condition to have a pancreatic pseudocyst, but if you have any pancreatic issue, and you're not a massive drinker, and you're not a big smoker, and you don't fit the sort of stereotypical things that everyone in the ER is going to be like, no, tell us the truth. How much do you drink? You know, you you got to see someone who is going to work with the abdominal uh, structures, and and the, if they've done visceral manipulation, um, then that is that should that has to be part of your plan. If you know anyone with this, um, it's like a PSA, a pancreatic pseudocyst uh, service announcement. Anyone who has that kind of uh, uh, issue going on with the pancreas, please make sure that you you see someone who can uh, do some manual work to at least assess that area, the epigastric area, and perhaps do some a manual therapy to open that up. Um, because if it's a structural problem, using only biochemical interventions is not, like you don't use Drano if you've got let's just like a bunch of hair in the drain, you gotta just pull the hair out. You got or you, you know pull I mean? the hair out first and then yeah, you can use it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or like yeah. when you're scraping, a, you're scraping something clean, you'd need some elbow grease, physical abrasive force, and then you can use the chemical kind of uh, to to sort of uh, clean up the job a bit, so yeah, it's a it's another example of uh, of really a structural based understanding of anatomy is really important to get good outcomes, and I I wish more people uh, knew about this kind of stuff. Yeah, I use that type of analogy too, like especially with the work in a gallbladder. I'm kind of like, listen, if you have one way streets going out, and some of those are blocked. It's going to create congestion. How well, like I can give you all the liver detoxification herbs we want, but how effective is that going to be of actually filtering and eliminating garbage from your body? Yes, the filtration system might happen, but the elimination is compromised. So then it's just going to get reabsorbed. And then what happens? So I have a client, when you brought this up, I have a client, she uh, struggles with various health issues right now. Um, And she came to me with, like she has very severe diabetes issues and we're managing it and we're back we're getting back on track and there's a little bit of stability. But about a year and a half, two years ago, she did a gallbladder flush with me and she noticed a huge difference in her digestive system, but never got around to doing a second one. And then something happened in her health. And then she kind of like lost her focus on what we were doing together and everything just kind of spiraled and like went out of control. But she had a fatty liver. Mm-hmm. And she has a fatty pancreas. And I was like, how does that even happen? I was like, I have never in my history as an atropath seen a fatty pancreas on an ultrasound. I think I've actually seen it now twice. There's another client of mine who has it. And I started working with her at my other clinic. And she's like, just tell me what to do and we'll help get rid of it. But for the same thing, because the gallbladder and the pancreas share a duct to actually eliminate their contents into the small intestines, 
if one is compromised, I'm not surprised the other one gets compromised. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, so, uh, once we get her a little bit more stable with her blood sugar, we're going to get back on doing like liver gallbladder flushes and allowing her body. Cause you're, you're also, if your pancreas is fatty and you have diabetes, your liver needs to be functioning well because liver has a lot to do with blood sugar regulation. So I want to get that organ clear so it can start getting rid of stuff. And because Ooh. we're implementing fasting, I want to make sure that her body's able to process all the garbage. But I've been wondering about like, how can I start to support the pancreas when the time comes? So I think the visceral manip is going to be a, a big, a big part of that. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to have to send her to someone who's done like VM234 because I haven't worked on the pancreas because that's that's not a preliminary entry way of organs for for visceral manipulation. You know what? It's it just because it's wimpy work. Or you can work around it. Like that's yeah. what I did. I worked around it. I didn't yeah. you know, because it's so like it is like that oatmeal in, in saran wrap or uh, plastic wrap. And uh, you kind of work around it on stuff that you do know. Um, but it's yeah, and it's amazing how a little um, you kind of little force and, and all that you need to get some results. Like he could feel some stuff moving. And I was yeah. just doing like, I was honestly just doing sphincters. Mostly Michelle, like he can't go wrong doing sphincter. work. No, no. Those I are the stoplights, right? So, and that's the just it. Like you're saying, if that's, if that's plugged up, well, you know, if, if, if you build a dam, it's going to stop the flow of water. <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> if your, if your exit route is plugged up, then it's going to stop the flow of anything out of it. And it exactly. makes, it makes so much sense. And it, it's true. It's something that, that logically you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But very few people are really considering that as part of the equation, at least not enough. Unless yeah, I think it needs to be considered yeah. at least. And like, I'm not saying here people like, I, you know, I have a 100% cure instantly from one, uh, one treatment, but I'm saying it, it's, it's a plausible and really, really uh, safe mm-hmm. uh, way of, of actually addressing, like using a different framework to address the, the assessment and the, and the treatment. And I, I think we'd be uh, amiss to not um, to look at it more. And actually I maybe, and maybe we'll just sort of, end with this uh or like this is this is the end of what i really have to say but I, I will say you 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 and i talking here has led me down to this other thing that i've seen um which is i don't know if you've seen a lot of like read a lot of labs on uh imaging of kidneys or well probably you've seen a lot with uh, livers maybe more than i have but mm-hmm. they'll often talk about incidental cysts or in like our uh like cysts but they they're of no concern it says it's of no concern it's of no con- it's like hmm, yeah i actually wonder if and I again, we've we've said this before. If I say something that's wrong, and you know, in five years we look back and go, "You were really wrong, Dave." Well, let me be. And let me try and say something here, and at the risk of sounding in the future like a complete knob, um, I I think some of these uh, renal cysts, like kidney cysts, and and maybe even liver. You'd again, you might know better than I. At least renal cysts, I think they form as at least a, con- a contributing factor that is a net increase in, in uh, resistance to flow downstream in a one way track where the cells are just, all they know is produce and send, produce and send, produce and send. The body's giving them signals. You need to make more whatever they're making right. uh, secretion or, or whatever. Uh, but if there's a blockage, it, that doesn't mean the cell is going to stop uh, producing and sending so it what it's going to do is get like i think similar to what's happening with this pancreatic pseudocyst is that you're now going to have like a kind of reflux mm. and so ureters and bladder sort of blockages or resistance to flow i think are, are possibly contributing to renal cysts and which are very common um at least the imaging i'm no i'm no nephrologist like i'm just no. i'm just a generalist naturopath it's- trying to do my thing but i've run into enough renal cysts to go yeah. wow they're pretty common i find cysts in general are not given the weight that maybe they deserve and by medical professionals it just feels kind of like oh it's a cyst it's fine so my understanding of cysts and i think what your 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 uh your ideas here i think are I think something that we should be considering uh, for sure. But I, I do know that parasites can also form cysts and evade our immune system that way. I do know that cysts, when I was speaking to someone who specialized in kidney issues, he said, you know, cysts are just sacks of inflammatory fluid. So sometimes your body sequesters things that it can't properly purge out of the system within a fluid filled sack, which is then seen mm-hmm. as a cyst. So mm-hmm. then you have to think about, okay, where, what organs are these particular 
little safety safety bags of contained toxins where are they and what is actually causing that organ to have to contain garbage so it doesn't infect the organ so Mm -hmm. i think that if there's a blockage and that organ can't detoxify because kidneys are a part of our detoxification and drainage system that's a big deal and i wonder if that's why cysts are often showing up in detox organs more than anything Mm -hmm. else they're showing up in kidneys they're showing up uh you can have like weird cysts in the skin you can have skin as an organ of elimination in your lymphatic system you can see them in you know the liver a lot so i wonder if maybe that's the correlation is like really uh, and, and that might have to do with visceral manipulation. And I also know that if the kidneys don't move optimally within the abdominal wall, cause they have a certain amount of movement, they are more prone to forming stones cause now there's more stagnation. And, and then that would probably also create a susceptibility to those cysts as well. So organ mobility, organ motility, communication with other organs, drainage, Hydration, all that's, it's, it's also freaking simple. important. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I'm with you on that. I feel like it's definitely something that should be given some strong consideration when it comes to assessing those types of clients mm-hmm. or those concerns. Yeah. And hopefully I'm not like. completely wrong, but right. But could ha, we, we, I, I think we, part we, of what like you're do, saying doctor, there, doctors are wrong all the time. I know. Medicine part has of been wrong all the time and science has been cysts, wrong all the time. So <laughs> yeah. Part of what you're saying about cysts and, and I full like I I've gone, like whether it's breasts, uh, breasts with cysts or cysts that are like on the trunk somewhere else or what I've always looked at cysts and going like, what the hell? Like what, the, what's going on yeah. here? And it, it's, I think collectively a lot of like medical professional people have, have kind of, that's why we've overlooked it. Cause we don't understand it that much. You're kind of like, Oh, it's a cyst, but whatever. It's like, well, yeah, I guess, but maybe not whatever. But then again, naturopaths are irritating for always asking why, or we're good for always asking why. Like yeah. BD does it, I do it, yeah. you do it, you know, yeah. why, 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 you know, cause there's, it's like a, <clears throat> it's like a, um, you know, when, when people adapt to trauma in a certain way, there was a reason to do it then it may not serve them in the future, but like there is usually adaptations have some, like maybe they're not all perfect, but usually the body's trying to achieve some at least short term, um, strategy that makes sense on some level. And that we have yeah. to try and make sense of it. And that's just it. Your body's always trying to keep you alive. So why did it have to do this to keep you alive? What's yeah. the stressor that made this the necessary lesser of the evils? <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, but yeah, I think okay. that I, I think that there would be such much better quality care for humankind if more physicians just asked a little bit more wise. So, and yeah. maybe learn how to you know support organs from a structural standpoint too. But you know, call me. You know. It's just my bias now after taking VM1. <laughs> Not a girl. But listen, uh, I'm going to keep asking why, and you're going to keep asking why, and uh, hopefully we get a little bit closer to, to the truth. You're here. All right. Bye, everyone.